Hey, did you know Bodybuilding.com actually offers free shipping on most orders over $49. Seriously. Just look for the Be Elite badge across the site and on your favorite supplements. Thousands of top products from the biggest brands are included, like Optimum, Gym, Dimatize, Cellucor, and plenty more. If you haven't already, check out bodybuilding.com slash be elite. That's all one word. Kind of looks like be elite for more details. Hey, hey everyone. Welcome here to the uh, bodybuilding.com podcast. I'm your host, Nick Coleus. Uh, Heather Eastman, an editor Hello. and bodybuilding insider. Yes. <laughs> Is there next to me? And over to my right, we've got a man fresh off of competition, off of photo shoots, off of doing a Facebook Live workout on bodybuilding.com's in the gym here yesterday. And he was even up at five o'clock this morning training chest with Chris Gethin. <laughs> yes, yeah, I, I was. Yeah. <laughs> how, are, how are the chesticles feeling at they're, the moment? They're feeling all right. I had a, a short nap after. Oh, just, that's, uh, that's oh. the way they do it. <laughs> you already yeah. got your rest in. He is Lee Constantinou, WBFF Pro, bodybuilding.com athlete. And we invited you here because we just wanted to ask one question. <laughs> who who would person. win in a fight between you and, and Kazito? <laughs> <laughs> well, considering Kazito is a bit of a martial art expert, mm -hmm. um, you know, you're, I might have to use. You were a karate black belt. I am a karate black belt. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, mm -hmm. I think know, it'd be a good fight. F f yeah, five years um, past since. But, um, <laughs> yeah. um, but I ask you that because um, <laughs> you you and Kazito both started off though as very serious martial artists, yeah. and then transitioned into bodybuilding, which I, I found to be kind of an interesting trajectory um is, yeah. and i was wondering you know not not but they're not it doesn't seem like it's just a different thing it kind of seems like what i've heard you talk about it's kind of an extension of the same thing yeah in its own way definitely T is. tell us about yeah. that yeah i don't talk about my martial arts a lot actually which is quite nice mm -hmm. to actually be asked about it because it feels like it was once upon a time but it's very much the things that i learned through my karate practicing mm -hmm. that has made me a better bodyboarder through the the discipline you know like we used to have to line up in rig rigorously like dead straight lines mm -hmm. and um you know i was doing that from 13 years old and you had to be square onto the person in front of you and to the person to the right and those little things that we used to do um just made you very structured and disciplined mm -hmm. within yourself standing up straight um being very aware of your surroundings and everything that I learned through, see the physical training as well, which is very intense. Um, you know, you couldn't drink water, which was kind of a bit wow. of an old yeah. Japanese um, tradition. Like during training? Yeah, during training, no water oh, wow. for that hour or two hours, if it is two hour session, mm -hmm. which, you know, at the time you, you do, because that's what you've been told by the, the sensei. But um, what about BCAAs? Then there's that. What's that? Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm just BC, yeah supplementation is <laughs> yeah. like probably still in there. You know, they they haven't reached that level. But um, you know, it taught me a lot of those those personal skills that um, have made me better as a an individual, made mm -hmm. me more self aware, um, disciplined, focused. You know, setting goals and achieving them. And so coming into the bodybuilding was kind of an extension of my karate. So I came into bodyboarding to look better, mm -hmm. essentially, because I was doing karate, I was losing loads of weight, but I wanted to look better as well. I was watching movies you know, with Van Damme and mm -hmm. Bruce Lee, and mm -hmm. I was like, I want to look like a fighter as well as be a fighter. And so that was why I got into the bodyboarding style training to uh, make me stronger. Um, and then slowly it transitioned and I became more passionate um, for the bodyboarding aspect and the aesthetic training and the, the strength I was gaining. And mm -hmm. it reached the point of diminishing returns by that once I was getting bigger, my karate wasn't able to meet, you know, I wasn't able to train with the same mm -hmm. um, level because you need mm -hmm. to have that elasticity and that strength. And so it kind of reached a point that I was, you know, top of my level of karate, I competed at university, um, went to European championships, and I was like the top of my game. Mm -hmm. And then almost within t like 12 weeks straight after my final year of university when you know, we did the university championships and we won several like medals as a team and individually I was like I'm doing a bodyboarding show mm. and then um, that's when it became all about the bodyboarding aspect mm. of my training and then my eight years of karate had stopped kind of because I graduated from uni and I was like going back home getting back into normality mm. and bodyboarding is, is something that you can do wherever you are you know there's no schedule um, of classes you just turn up to the gym and you right. train mm -hmm. and it was more um, uh, sustainable and like mm. something I could get more into mm -hmm. and that just became my focus so yeah karate was definitely shaped the way I've become as a bodyboarder and in, in the the discipline 
the focus, mm -hmm. the um, all those things that you learn from being a karate practitioner or martial artist in general mm -hmm. that have transitioned and made me a better bodybuilder as mm. a result. Initially, did you research how your favorite martial artist trained with weights? Because yeah, uh, I've looked at you know a bunch of Bruce Lee's old weight routines. They're bodybuilding routines, oh, really. Yeah. Like uh, yeah. some some of those guys are light bodybuilders as well. Yeah, I remember I didn't come across a lot. There wasn't lots of you know, resources on, on the martial arts at the time. And obviously, bodybuilding.com has been around since I started training mm -hmm. um, the early years, but there was no specific things around how, what they did. I remember seeing Bruce Lee doing pull-ups and pull-downs for his lats. Mm -hmm. um, so that was Terrifying something. Terrifying lats. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is kind of this vacuum he used to do. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Van Damme, you'd, and they used to do a lot of, like, old traditional training with, mm -hmm. like, Japanese, like, especially the Japanese karateka who used, like, wooden, they used to use, like, clay pots and pick them up and walk mm -hmm. with them and do yeah. really traditional things mm -hmm. and they used to actually have this setup in their garden you, uh, of a I can't remember the name of it um, but it's basically like this pad that you 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 dig into the ground and you punch it so you mm -hmm. can build conditioning so they have these very old mm -hmm. school methods which I couldn't do right. many of um, and I didn't really come across a lot of the mm. what they did to get like that I, I gathered that they did a lot of body weight training mm -hmm. like pull ups and dips and stuff right. you know Van Damme as well you know, he was probably the one who I really aspired to from his physical shape mm -hmm. and um, you know just seeing what he did in the, in the movies was kind of enough to, to get the idea that what he did was more than just a um, sure. martial arts mm -hmm. yeah, but there's more splits in there as well yeah, than anybody splits. wants to do I, 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 I wish I had that hip flexibility uh, <laughs> to do what he could do but um, I never had it yeah you um, I just watched your pull up video that we have on bodybuilding.com and you ha I have to say you have one of the best pull up forms I've ever seen oh, you actually she says keep... that to everybody though. well and, and uh, yeah not to fangirl out on it but no and and you um, you also mentioned at one point when you were a kid that you felt like you weren't very coordinated in sports and so can you kind of tell us a little bit about that transition that you made i mean you said you you lied about your age to sneak into the gym <laughs> and work out with your older brother so at what point yeah. did you kind of say okay this is where i fit this is where i belong it's really interesting actually you say that because when i um so as a kid in in sports and um athletics like i said you know i never had that natural ability to to run in with the best coordination to to shoot hoops with the best um skill or kick a ball because mm -hmm. football sport um, soccer mm -hmm. is really popular back home and um i just didn't have that hand-eye coordination with, with sports like that and when i got into karate i i just be became really good because i must have had a really good self-awareness of where my body positioning was mm -hmm. and it'll and teach how to, it if you don't have it yeah right. and how to exactly and how to do things and and i and i was i was um encouraged by my teachers for my ability to do what we call kata, which is kind of like a pattern or a dance mm -hmm. where you do sequence of moves. Mm -hmm. um, I was good at remembering them. I was good at performing them um, and doing them to a higher standard than the grade I was. And I think through being able to know where my body positioning was and what felt right and what looked right, because mm -hmm. I'd watch them back and I would do competitions, it, it made me better at executing um, exercises mm -hmm. as a bodybuilder and become more um, conscious of how I'm doing things because I was aware that if I do it incorrectly, it won't serve the right purpose or mm -hmm. work the right muscle group. And so I become a bit of a technique freak in mm -hmm. that I want to do things properly from doing things properly as a karate practitioner mm -hmm. and now as a bodybuilder. And so I will, I guess it's kind of a, a bit of a natural ability to see, especially on other people as well as myself, what looks right mm -hmm. from doing it for many years, you know, from being 15 years old, going to the gym, learning literally from doing nothing to, you know, watching a few dudes in the gym, pick up the weights and go, okay, that's how you do that exercise. And that's how you do that. And then slowly I'm um, experiencing it for myself. And then I found watching it back had always been a real, um, mm -hmm helpful tool to make my form better so mean video video you constantly video yeah, yourself kind of, mm -hmm. yeah but i never shared it you know i mm -hmm, wish i sure. did at the time because you know social media wasn't a big mm -hmm. thing then but yeah, no that's a great that's a great skill a lot of coaches say even if you don't share it with anybody just, just it. watch mm -hmm. it and maybe even share it with somebody who you their feedback you would trust exactly mm -hmm. and i had my brother as well who would you know watch over me and we mm -hmm. would check each other's form um and you know it did come with a few injuries and and learning through not wanting to get that same injury is what mm -hmm. makes you 
not want to do that same thing incorrectly again mm -hmm. or seeing a muscle imbalance. So the example you gave, the doing the pull up for years, I would pull up and kind of round my mm -hmm. shoulders forward as mm -hmm. most people naturally want to do until I discovered that to actually work the lats and looking at the biomechanics of the movement and the way the muscle was shaped, it's, it was more efficient to do it in the way I now do it. Right. And that's the kind of a, a pl application that I've had with all the other exercises mm -hmm. and particularly the big ones, you know, mm -hmm. the compound exercises, which people struggle with mostly mm -hmm. um, and just um, fine tuning it, which suits me and how I need to lift to, for my body, but also being aware for, for clients as right. well. Cause yeah, I train because you're a personal too. trainer. I imagine yeah, this could help you a lot there, but also help you posing on stage. Massively. Yeah. So yeah, I've actually, which I, nobody really knows this. I haven't shared this. Um, one, uh, my first two ever bodyboarding shows mm -hmm. um, in the UK, the BMBF, I, I not only won my categories, but I also won the overall pre presentation for posing in the whole show mm -hmm. no against kidding. the senior men and mm -hmm. everyone. Guys who've been up. doing this for a so, lot longer. Exactly. Yeah. And that was like, wow, to me, because mm -hmm. I didn't just win my first show. I'd won the posing presentation, mm -hmm. which I made up myself with a bit of music and, you know, and, and that for me was quite cool to mm -hmm. win something that I didn't even intend on doing mm -hmm. and then do it again for a second time. Mm -hmm. And that um, awareness of how to move my body and flex and mm -hmm. stuff has definitely helped my lifting as well, mm -hmm. because I posed a lot when I was doing the mm -hmm. natural bodybuilding, you know, you have to flex your legs, your back, everything at the same time. And after every show, you would get this crazy doms, like you had a full body workout, mm -hmm. very different to doing like the fitness model or the physique posing, because you know, you're not flexing everything. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that muscle connection made me better at lifting in the gym. Mm -hmm. You know, I really do. I know a lot of guys and bodybuilders talk about the my muscle connection mm -hmm. and, you know, bringing out detail with posing in a bodybuilding way, but it really does allow you to connect better with muscle groups that you struggle to connect with. Mm -hmm. And so if I, if you like most people can't flex their legs, right? Especially if that's their first bodybuilding show. Mm -hmm. And so by doing, you know, months and months of flexing and kind of squeezing through your feet and, and contracting the quads, I was able to better contract them during my training as well. And then they grew as a result. Hmm. So this this first show, because you've you competed a lot now. In the I last have, year. yeah. I so have. That this first show uh, that, that, that you won, um, what was that? What was that prep like in hindsight? <laughs> was it was it just sort of a you know um, flying off, off the cuff preparation you did all yourself, or did you have a plan, or how how hard was it? It's quite interesting. My my first prep. So a friend of mine at the time, he was my training partner at university, mm -hmm. um, Michael, and he competed as a teenager. Um, two years prior to that. And he, we were training at the same gym in North London. And that's how I knew of him. And I knew this guy had competed and he was like super lean. And, you know, I aspired to that because I was two years young, one year younger than him. And then we happened to be in the same academic year at university um, in West London, which is very rare and, you know, to, to, for something to happen. But, uh, you know, everything happens for a reason. Mm -hmm. And so we ended up being training partners in our final year of university. And he entered the junior competition um, as it was an under 23 category and he said I should as well and I laughed it off like I was instantly like this isn't mm -hmm. a possibility like right. I cannot physically do that I was training for karate like five six days a week mm -hmm. burning lots of calories um, trying to make a weight for karate which kind of was counterintuitive to trying to bodybuild mm -hmm. and so um, I had we basically followed I followed his diet in bearing mm -hmm. in mind, he was about 10 kilos heavier than me. Um, Just we, to the, to the gram. To the T, to the gram. Mm -hmm. And I, we, I remember it, it was 60 grams of oats for breakfast mm -hmm. made with water, uh -huh. of course. which is <laughs> porridge or oatmeal, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> we call it porridge, by the way. I know you guys are laughing oh, when yeah. I say yeah. porridge, mm -hmm. oatmeal, and then um, six egg whites and mm -hmm. protein shake. Mm -hmm. And then five meals of which are 220 grams of white potato, mm -hmm. 100 grams of broccoli and 140. 220 grams of uncooked chicken, and that was it. That's the 220 whole. 220 uncooked, and then five times a day. Okay. Oh, the same meal five times same a day meal five for times a day. 12 weeks. 12 weeks. Which hmm. is surprisingly effective. If is you it? Just, yeah, if you just do the same thing over and over, you huh. stop having to think about it. It's, it, it was, yeah. but then, so it was effective in, in that it got me lean enough t to win, mm -hmm. but it, it um, eliminated food groups, which um, I found caused me to have some, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Some. Deficiencies? De deficiencies one, yeah, deficiencies, but also building up some intolerances. Mm -hmm. So I, cause I didn't oh, have dairy for so long. Okay. 
dairy became a problem when I first had yeah. it after the 12 weeks because okay. my body was like, what is this? Right, you, know? you don't have the enzymes anymore exactly. or something, yeah. And so I got mm -hmm. bloated um, very easily from taking on dairy. And so I, you, if you do come off taking something out of the diet, you have to really introduce it slowly, mm. otherwise yeah. your body's under shock. And so that was uh, not ideal for me, but I guess, you know, the, the diet that we had worked more so for me, probably because I was at a, a leaner state than him. My activity levels were higher significantly because of the karate. And, um, I actually, you know, I got pretty lean considering mm -hmm. the diet wasn't set for me and it had no consideration for macros or calories, but it, I must've been in a deficit and mm -hmm. enough to lose body fat. And so, yeah, it wasn't the worst diet, but it wasn't the best diet and it wasn't the most sustainable because mm -hmm. after that show, which was a 12 week prep, mm -hmm. we, um, he said to me, we can have two weeks off now because we had the British finals in 10 weeks. We can have two weeks off training and we don't have to be on the diet. So that was my first opportunity to eat like an animal, mm -hmm. <laughs> which put me back by two, st I put on a stone and a half actually in those two weeks, which mm -hmm. is about well, there's 14 pounds to the stone. All right, so it's a solid 20 pounds. Yeah, solid 20 pounds yeah, in two weeks. Mm -hmm. I was a mess, you know, mm -hmm. bloated, you know, retaining a lot of water, accumulated a lot of body mm -hmm. fat. And then I went on this kind of low carb keto diet style, you know, which had, again, no consideration for macros, but just eat loads of protein and mm -hmm. have some fats, but super mm -hmm. low carbs. And I pulled it in within the eight weeks, but what I found was I lost a lot of muscle tissue Mm -hmm. um, in that time to, to kind of get back to that level of definition mm -hmm. plus a bit further for the show. And I sacrificed muscle tissue purely because my body, which I, I now know is a sugar burner. Mm -hmm. You know, my body mm -hmm. prefers carbohydrates as a as fuel source. And I was doing a lot of weight training and high intensity stuff. Mm -hmm. And the training wasn't matching up with the diet. And when you train with that, with that way, if your body prefers carbs, you will burn into tissue. And so I, you know, I came in super lean and dry for the show, but, um, small and you relatively know, high volume training that you were doing relatively. Then? Yeah. So like, mm -hmm. I, was, I imagine that being a little bit more carb friendly. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the protocol I was following was cardio every single morning for an hour fasted mm -hmm. at 6 AM mm -hmm. and then weights at 4 PM, five, to six days a week with hit following that Oof. cardio session. So mm -hmm. I was just training like an animal, mm -hmm. like, you know, I lived to train at this point. Mm -hmm. I was a full-time bodybuilder. I just graduated from uni. I had, uh, I was working in a health supplement shop two days a week. Mm -hmm. And so the rest of my time was bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. And in that eight weeks, I, I got that result, but I burnt out, you know, after that, mm -hmm six months of my first show prep um i was so burnt out and like life was like i was exhausted you know mm -hmm. it was september time and then once again being on the low carbs as soon as i touched carbs i blew up within three weeks i put on two stone which is 28 pounds mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i was like rock bottom you know my i wasn't happy with mm -hmm. with the fact that what i had attained had so quickly been reversed because mm -hmm. i didn't have a plan post show, I didn't have a plan of how to come out of this diet, um, mm -hmm. strategically. And because of what I put my body through to get there, you know, the lower carbohydrate, the super high intensity training, the volume, the frequency, and, um, going from that to cutting back to, you know, five sessions, four sessions a week wasn't enough. It was too much too soon. Mm -hmm. And, um, the next year I was coming back to do the, the same show because I wanted to win the British final. I came third that year that I was like, burnt out mm -hmm. and I was like I need to find a better way to do this I don't want to eliminate foods and I don't want to restrict myself and so I had um a guy who had just won the the British natural bodybuilding um pro card that year guide me because he had done it really successfully he looked great on stage he didn't seem to eliminate foods in mm -hmm. his diet and um he guided me through the prep which had more variety I ate fruit that prep mm -hmm. um I did a lot more hit training though with him. So it wasn't as much do loads of like low intensity. It was like do more hit training, but eat more carbs. Mm -hmm. So I was doing this like high carbohydrate, 400 gram daily intake, but getting leaner and my body preferred that. Mm -hmm. And um, although I was younger, I could take the high intensity training. The carbohydrates was keeping me going, keeping mm -hmm. me fueled and keeping my muscle mass most importantly for this prep. And, um, I looked good and I was happy and I ended up winning the British junior title from that preparation. 
um, on the higher carb diet. And so like, great, you know, I found a, a new approach. And I've done three different preps, you know, three different experiences. Right. But then there was always more. I've always wanted to be like, there must be a better way than this. Right. You know, there must be a way of not having to do cardio till the, you know, till the end of time. And there must be a way of eating a little bit more freely. And flexible dieting was just coming to light at this mm -hmm. point. People were starting to talk about it a bit more. Mm -hmm. It was 2011, so it's several mm -hmm. years ago sure. now. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, I looked into it, I read into it, and I was like, how are these guys eating Pop-Tarts and getting shredded? Mm -hmm. You know, that was the curiosity. <laughs> that was the, the big, yeah. the big uh, you know, thing at the time. And it was like, how can I eat crap and get away with it? So my first flexible dieting prep was uh, for a WBFF show where I would deliberately fit in um, processed foods and junk food because I was allowed it, mm -hmm. right? This was a revolution to me. Mm -hmm. I'm allowed to eat these things and I can get leaner. <clears throat> and so I did the prep and had these kind of silly bowls of like yogurt and mm -hmm. prop tarts and whatever I can get away with at the end of the mm -hmm. day um, on top of a decent amount of good food. But that wasn't the, that wasn't the best way either for me mm -hmm. because it was like I was starting to um, use food like food I was becoming food focused because I was like looking forward to this bowl of right. junk at the end of the night yeah kind that's of easy to get yeah, into it's I imagine. a drug and it's sugar right and sugar's <laughs> yeah. addictive mm -hmm. and once you have a bit of it you want more of it and so um, although I was able to get relatively lean I didn't get quite as lean because I didn't give myself enough time that approach it worked to, in that I can you I know you can lose body fat on it, but from a health point of view, mm -hmm. and from a sustainability point of view, and from a food relationship point of view, it wasn't the best approach. And so, ever since that time, now I've been more aware of the flexible dieting. I've just used it to my advantage to eat healthier and more variety, mm -hmm. and not eliminate foods. Mm -hmm. And that is kind of where I'm at right now. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of eating a healthy, balanced diet. Um, not limiting and not cutting out foods. And that has been able to give me preps which are more sustainable. And I, I'll finish the show like I just did and feel like life isn't any different. I'm just eating a little bit more mm -hmm. and I'm happier. I know it's I, at, at any point in there after that first, second, third, fourth prep, you could have said, all right, that's it. I'm just, I'm done competing. They're like this is, this is too hard. This, this experiment is just, it's too much, <laughs> but you keep coming back. Yeah. What, what is it about that, that process that just that fascinates you enough to keep you coming back over and over yeah. again? So this coming show, the show I just did in Sacramento would mm -hmm. have been my 10th competition mm -hmm. in six years, which sounds crazy for someone who's 27 and people go, you've been in doing it for a while. And I, and I have, but what it is, is that draws me back is the learning mm -hmm. from the different experiences and the not knowing of what's going to happen in four months time, you know, because, you know, you cannot have a clear run for three months, four months and, and say, I'm going to do the show prep and nothing's going to get in my way. You know, mm -hmm. life has throws curveballs and things mm -hmm. come up and you have to kind of roll with it. And I kind of have been embracing those things that come up and those responsibilities that come with growing up with bodybuilding and um, I've certainly made the experiences a little bit more challenging because I'm not devoted to bodyboarding as I used to be. You know, I'm trying to live a life, I'm trying to train clients, I'm trying to build my business at the same time now. So there's more things um, going for me and, and that makes the preps a little bit more challenging, but mm -hmm. also more enjoyable because it's not my life. It's become an aspect of my life mm -hmm. rather than consuming my life. Right. Mm -hmm. And what draws me back is seeing those improvements that I'm, I'm striving for from the training that I'm doing. So I'm, I'm training with the intention of building muscle every time I walk in the gym. You know, I'm not somebody who gains muscle easily. So the time to put myself to the test is when I strip body fat down and get on a stage and mm -hmm. present myself. Like mm -hmm. that's truly the time that I see the difference. I can't, I take measurements and I check my weight, but it's only when I really get on that stage that I can really see the improvements that I've made. And it's when I can see those improvements myself other people can see it, that I get that satisfaction that what I am doing is the, on the right path for what I want to, what I see myself as achieving and becoming mm -hmm. rather than the placing that I've got. Mm. And so although recently I just came second in the, the Men's Physique show, I was super happy and like one of the happiest I've ever been coming not first purely because I was really happy with the physique that I brought to the stage and mm -hmm. the preparation and how everything came together, you know, being in the U S out of my comfort zone and preparing, preparing my food in somewhere that I had done before. And mm -hmm. it was all very different, but rewarding for me to see, you mm -hmm. know, 
Yeah, it's almost like you set yourself up with this series of challenges. You were flying halfway around the world yeah. <laughs> in a new city, and and yeah, yeah, it, that's it, that's great that you're that. And yeah, you're competing kind of with yourself. You're not definitely. Yeah. Oh yeah, because you know, as as you guys probably know, yeah, you know, there are a lot of politics in in competitions mm-hmm. as well, and you you know you you can't dictate that. It's a subjective sport bodyboarding and it's always going to be about somebody's opinion of what they like and so you you can only do your best to bring your best Mm -hmm. you know once you bring your best self if that's enough on the day great you know if it's if it's not then so be it but as long as you're happy with what you've done and you let you've left no stone unturned during that prep and you don't have any regrets then that is when you've won Mm -hmm. and this year i feel like i've won that that battle and I'm not saying it was perfect you know I messed up loads mm-hmm. I had about four or five blowouts and I was honest you know I shared it on my social media I said guys mm-hmm. look last night I blew out you know mm-hmm. I ate a ton of crap and I I feel kind of bad for it but I want you to know that I'm normal and anyone who's going through a strict regime um, process of getting lean you are going to have moments of weakness mm-hmm. and um, it's a matter of facing them head on and sharing them and being honest and rather than secretly eating and pretending it never happened. Mm-hmm. Right. Once I brought it to light and I shared it, it was like it was quite um, quite revolutionary for me to have done that because then I was more self-aware and I had um, a lot more self-control for mm-hmm. the rest of that prep. Mm-hmm. And you're probably able to l- limit the damage at least, right? Like one Absolutely. one blowout. How much yeah. damage can one right. blowout like that exactly. really do versus? two, three weeks of, exactly. all right, secret blowout. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And <laughs> I kind of use it to train harder. I was like, mm-hmm. you know what? I did that yesterday. I'm going to lift harder today. I'm going to push myself that bit more. So psychologically, sometimes um, it kind of helped me in mm-hmm. some ways to mm-hmm. push my training um, to a point. And I wouldn't suggest someone does it, but if you right. are in that position, you, you know, reverse kind of the psychology of feeling bad and down about it and go do something about it and think of it as fuel to train harder that day. Hmm. Now, I've, I've heard a, I've heard coaches and competitors in the past say that just the process of getting seriously lean for a show mm-hmm. is just a great thing to go through, not only, you know, for the ritual of it and for everything you learn, but because they find that it makes their bodies incredibly receptive to muscle gain afterwards, mm-hmm. just going up and down like that. Do you find that after you really dial it in, your body's like, all right, here we go, time to grow again? Yeah, I, I certainly feel the, the benefits of eating more, that, you know, filling mm-hmm. out and getting that life back in you that's kind of gets sucked mm-hmm. slowly as you get closer to the comp. And so you have a more of an appreciation for life, certainly, because you are kind of picked up again. Um, but I do see the strength gains as well. I mean, I don't, I, I'm sure there are significant muscle gains after the, the show, but it's very insignificant in that you can't see it. You know, right. you just mm-hmm. kind of fill out and- mm-hmm. And then you f- go, oh, if only I looked like this yeah. three weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, but then you kind of lose a bit of the abs right. at the yeah. same time. So it's like, <laughs> yeah, it does feel good to mm-hmm. um, to get that post-show fill out and um, you know, coming off a diet, whether you are doing it for a show or just for yourself, mm-hmm. it does feel good to slowly reintroduce food again because you have a better appreciation mm-hmm. for those, uh, for those, for some, for those yeah, tastier mm. foods. And so, so somebody who, who maybe is just fresh off of their, their first show or mm-hmm. has that coming up, how do you, how do you recommend they, they come off of that? Uh, what, are the, what, are the, what are the most important things for somebody to keep in mind after they've really gotten lean, training-wise, nutrition-wise, the first time? I would say if someone is just about to compete, you know, within four weeks of doing a show or competing or you know, reaching their point of end of their transformation, mm-hmm. is to be very aware of what's to come after. Like, have a plan before it comes around. I That was one of my biggest downfalls. It was doing like getting so focused and laser targeted towards this competition date that I'd almost not worry or not care about anything else that was to come after it. It was almost Mm -hmm. like dragging yourself over a finish line. You know what I'm saying? So there's like nothing else you can't even stand back up Mm -hmm. as opposed to jogging over the finish line and being able to do another lap. And that, that is having a plan after the show. It's being aware that after the show, I am going to have a little bit of you know, one or two meals or a day off, but I need to get back to a structured plan um, mm-hmm. and reintroduce food um, and my calories very soon after to one, get my, my, my mind in a good place, but also to get your metabolism firing again. So I'd try and come back to maintenance calories mm-hmm. fairly quickly, you know, within a week or two to be eating what your body maintains at. Um, bearing in mind that you are at a leaner state now, so your body um, is going to 
not be able to take on the same amount of calories it did before, right. but it can take on more significantly more than when you are kind of depleted just before you get on stage. So it's about reintroducing calories sooner, mm -hmm. um, trying to cut down or half the cardio that you're doing within the first couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. So you're not cutting it out completely, but you're just reducing it down. And what I like to say to clients or people who are coming out of a show is that, you know, you've increased your cardio incrementally um, over the period of 12, 14 weeks. You need to come, you need to bring it down in a similar fashion as well. You can't just stop cardio straight mm -hmm. away because your mm -hmm. body's gonna be under the shock of not having that expenditure anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. So we need to taper it down, um, bring the calories up, and kind of within that kind of two months, if you've done a four month prep, let your body come back to a normal state and then slowly, you know, increase the calories up from the maintenance into a surplus. And, mm -hmm. um, but having a plan is ultimately mm -hmm. what it comes down to. How you do that is up to the individual, but it's really about knowing that after this show, I need to be prepared for, you know, what's to come. Because mm. everybody I speak to, clients, I'm like, I tell them, listen, you are gonna want, you're gonna see food very differently after you do this show. You know, you might not have had a food um, problem before, you might not have craved mm. things, you might not have um, had a food focused mindset, but you will after the show. That's just what it does to mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. And everybody I speak to, and especially when I'm, you know, trying to coach clients out of a competition, it's like, it's normal to want these, foods that you didn't have during your prep you know allow yourself it but we need to stay within a plan we need to have mm -hmm. structure otherwise if you just go all out you'll do what i did and gain two stone in three weeks mm -hmm. and feel terrible right? feel terrible yeah. and life it becomes you know not very great mm -hmm. and i don't want you to feel like that and so the advice i give is very much like four weeks before the show is like look you're going to be ready for the show let's think about what's to come after that mm -hmm. and and be ready for you know the challenges you are gonna face because everybody's gonna face them. Mm -hmm. Unless you are like a seasoned pro, you've been doing it for 20, 30 right. years. I think especially the the earlier competitors who have maybe pushed their bodies too hard mm -hmm. are gonna rebound just like everyone else. So it's being a, very self-aware that that is very normal, mm -hmm. but not letting it consume you. Mm -hmm. So as you've gotten older and more experienced, do you find that the up and down of in season, off season, bulking and cutting has smoothed out at all for you, or do you still do you, are, there, are there big steps still there? No, it's definitely smoothed out for me since mm -hmm. um, having that self awareness of mm -hmm. what could happen if I let myself go. Mm -hmm. I've got a very medium metabolism, so I mm -hmm. feel that if I prep, I can get leaner. But if I stop prepping and I eat loads, I can gain loads of weight unnecessarily. So I feel like my body's very much in the middle. Some guys or, or women with fast metabolisms can kind of get away with more food. Mm -hmm. After the show, guys with slow metabolism, metabolisms were kind of can't eat as much too soon after. So it all depends on your body type. But um, I certainly feel that because I've done this many times now, mm -hmm. I'm aware of what could be versus what I would rather, which is to come out of it and do it the healthy way, mm -hmm. get back to um, a calorie intake, which is sufficient that I feel happy, but not gain 20, 30 pounds right. of body fat unnecessarily, mm -hmm. because then I can't do things like shoot for body when I caught no. or, <laughs> you know what I mean? Or, or do, do mm -hmm. fitness related work where I need to look healthy and fit. And you know, that is what it's about. And um, I don't want to, have those fluctuations again. I don't want to bulk and cut. I don't want to be excessive or extreme. You know, although this is an extreme sport, I don't want it to, to be an extreme thing that I go through mm -hmm. to to get there. Because it is. It's like super extreme, get to six percent, five percent body fat, then gain twenty and fifteen percent body fat. Mm -hmm. Like it, it shouldn't be that. You know, it should be healthy. It should be balanced. It should be kind of um, something that you you do, but it doesn't become like you don't look completely different from six months before right, your show. You're an entirely different person. Yeah, it's just mm -hmm. not, I don't think it's a good representation of health and fitness when bodybuilders or physique pros or bikini pros do this crazy bulk and, mm -hmm. you know, to, to gain a fraction or two pounds of muscle. Because you know, realistically, naturally, we can only gain a few pounds of muscle a year mm -hmm. if you are kind of more seasoned and trained. And so it's like, is it really worth having 30 pounds of body fat to gain those two pounds? And right. is it efficient for your hormones, you know, to, to, to gain it? Mm -hmm. Probably not because you reach a point where your hormones um, don't produce as much testosterone because there's too much body fat. And then actually it's counterintuitive to what you're trying to achieve. 
And so mm -hmm. um, I kind of like to look healthy mm -hmm. with the off season mm -hmm. and be functional and still be able to do the things that make me feel good, like a bit of cardio every mm -hmm. now and then, mm -hmm. go to yoga and still feel like I can get into a stretch without my stomach mm -hmm. getting in the way, you right. know, mm -hmm. do all those things that make me feel good. Um, whilst my bodybuilding and you know I'm, I'm growing in the off season. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, yeah, and, and you still have decent energy level for your training too. Right. I, I, I watched your session down there yesterday, partly because I was training down there at the same time, and then this morning watched it again. And it takes a lot of energy to uh, fit that much volume into an hour. Yeah. Is that is that uh, does, does your training fluctuate like that, or do you really just do you you is it is volume the the style that you prefer year round? No, so that's interesting. We so the, what we shot yesterday was a a, pr a workout from my Herculean trainer program, mm -hmm. and it's it was a week five of the program. So the first three weeks are focused more on, and this is how I train as well. It's more mm -hmm. hypertrophy strength training. So I'm focusing on heavier lifts, lower repetitions, longer rest. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to build that muscle density. And then the second three weeks are more higher volume mm -hmm. um, hypertrophy training. So again, we're cutting the rest down and going for more reps. So we're trying to get, you know, target the two muscle types, muscle type fibers, you know, you've got the slow twist, the fast switch, mm -hmm. sarcopasmic muscle growth. But in growth. distinct phases. Exactly, yes. in distinct mm -hmm. phases. And so that was an example of a higher volume training session, mm -hmm. which can also burn a lot of calories for people who, you know, want to feel that pump. You know, some people kind of like that volume training where you get the pump and you feel like, mm -hmm. you know, fired up, whereas, I, I actually prefer the heavier lifting for me. I find my physique suits and responds better to lower volume and heavier density training. Mm -hmm. So you know, training with a five, six to eight, uh, one RM, mm -hmm. you know, that, that helps me maintain muscle more so than, you know, 20, 30 rep sets training. Mm -hmm. hmm. 12 to 15 is like my top end. Yeah, it seems like you, um, more than anyone that I've talked to recently, really focus on kind of the other aspects of training that we don't talk about, which are the rest in between the exercises and your rest days and what you're doing outside of the gym and your posing. And, and yeah. do you feel that having that kind of well-rounded focus is what's added to your success and have you incorporated that into your Herculean trainer? Yeah, so definitely having other things that, that, that take me away from just bodyboarding has made me a better bodybuilder and mm -hmm. coach because I can relate better to other people who don't make this is where this isn't their life. Mm -hmm. You know, once upon a time, this was all I, I, you know, lived for. It was to look better for the stage. And now I, I've realized that there's more to life and I'm want, I'm finding that balance. And by doing things like going to yoga, um, keeps me grounded, um, literally as well, mm -hmm. because it's very much about you know connecting with yourself internally you know i'm in a class full of full of women and, and guys who are like yogis and mm -hmm. and i'm there right. you came to one of the ones here once didn't I did, you yeah. oh, i remember I that did. yeah it was yeah. a yoga class and i was like i'm gonna do it. do it anymore it's tragic really i did check the calendar to uh -huh. see if they did it. <laughs> but you know i enjoy trying things like that mm -hmm. you know i um three days out from my show i went to a, a yoga class in sacramento and you know i i felt really good for doing that because that that ability to stretch and open up the muscles and the mm -hmm. joints, you know, increases the blood circulation, which helps with your recovery, you know, lowers your cortisol levels, which can help you build muscle and burn fat. So it's like these little things that you do outside of the gym contribute to the gains you make in the gym and the ability to move um, with better range of motion, which mm -hmm. you can, you know, use more, you can build more strength, more power, and obviously build more muscle. So. Mm -hmm. I, I can, whenever I go to yoga on a Sunday and I train on a Monday, like a push workout where I'm doing the bench press, my shoulder mobility is so much better mm -hmm. than when I've missed the yoga on a Sunday. And I can really feel the difference purely from what the, the benefits of doing that style of training. Mm -hmm. And that's made me do more of that style of you know yoga because I can see the benefit you know, immediately in my training the next day. And it doesn't affect, you know, your ability to build muscle. Right. If anything, it gives you more length and more range so you can build better quality muscle. Mm -hmm. And um, it also gives you that bodily awareness you were talking mm -hmm. about earlier, being able to control things, know where your body is in space. Yeah, I mean, yeah just your form has to has to be better as a result. Of yeah, that, definitely. definitely. And you just feel better in mm -hmm. yourself when mm -hmm. you when you move better. When I've been 205 at my heaviest or two, no, 210 at my heaviest, I just felt horrible. Like I didn't mm -hmm. feel 
functional. I didn't feel fit. I didn't feel healthy anymore. I just kind of could push some heavy weights and, but that wasn't enough. I didn't feel fully satisfied. And so I finding that balance and doing these other things certainly make me feel um, happier and healthier and more energized. Mm-hmm. Do you find that it helps cut down on the amount of time you need to spend uh, doing the work, the warm up, warm up, doing all this mobility stuff that you see people doing in the gym before they can cram themselves under the bench press? Actually, no, I, I still have my, my routines. My I'm still quite big on the mobility warm up. I get on the foam roller most sessions and um, I use like a lacrosse ball, a trigger point ball, mm-hmm. and I get really into those acute areas that are naturally tight. And then um, there's a bit of dynamic stretching. So I've got a bit of a format that I like to follow. And it's kind of help, it helps me mentally prepare for the mm-hmm. workout. If I just jump on and do a flat bench and with a bar, mm-hmm. I don't feel like I've mentally prepared for the workout. I feel like I need to do those routinely things mm-hmm. before I go to even start lifting a weight just because um, it gets everything aware. You know, the nerve endings start firing up. Your your muscles become awake. Mm-hmm. You become very tuned in to what you're about to do. And because I train quite early, I train like after some clients in the morning, I have like in the same gym. So I'm not changing the environment. I need to very quickly change my mindset to be, you know, a bit selfish within that hour Mm -hmm. because it needs to be about my training and, you know, what I'm doing with my body. So I I do my warm up routine to get myself kind of tuned into what I'm about to do, get the headphones in and, you know, and yeah, kind of hit the workout from there. But I find it helps me improve my especially on leg day you know my my squat depth right. the strength you know prevents injuries because i've had a few injuries last year which were horrible like i pulled my ql Ooh. from yeah it's a really horrible feeling just kind of dull ache in your lower back mm-hmm. i was like you know what? i don't want to get i don't want this again let me do something about it and mobility became a bit more focused for mm-hmm. me from the end of last year and yeah i kept it up hmm. Good. Well, if you want to go see this, uh, the workout you did yesterday, um, we'll link to it on, underneath yeah. this episode. And you High have volume. you have another another back and biceps workout on our. I do our more of a heavy our... strength. Okay, yeah, he's got a so those phases, both yeah. phases. Are... <laughs> oh, that's right, I remember that one. It's now my screen. Saver. Well, uh, Lee Constantinou, thanks so much for coming and talking with us. Thank you for having me. I've uh, yes, really enjoyed you. my time here in Boise, and thank you guys. And good luck with everything. Mm-hmm. And the 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 uh, program, the ebook is called Hercule Lean. Right, Herculean. it's all it's all oblique things where you're leaning or it's just a pure oblique <laughs> trainer <It's> one-legged <laughs> exactly yeah, so her- herculean is kind of like something that i wanted to create from my all the all the experiences that i've had and it kind of embodies and and it kind of um it is what i i feel my training is it's mm-hmm. about being not just lean but like this this character of strength and courage and and that's what i the, the program that i created which is all around that and i created my group of herculean heroes and, and my private community and mm-hmm. you know i'm trying to encourage people to um overcome their barriers and all their obstacles to to you know to become their better self as well through training and lifting weights and and through the program so yeah that's herculeanebook.com if anyone's all interested. right so check it out yeah. thank you very much thank you for having me our pleasure so here's the thing during the month of july 2017 we are participating in the annual people's choice podcast awards and we're asking for our listeners to nominate the bodybuilding.com podcast for an award Here's the deal. Go to podcastawards.com between July 1st and 31st to nominate the show in categories like People's Choice, Health, and Sports and Recreation. The ceremony will happen on International Podcast Day, September 30th. And you can spread the word on social media by using the hashtag PCA17.